to our virtual OPT Artist Talk series. My name is Megan. I am the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at the Vernon Public Art Gallery. Um, as a cultural institution, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I am located on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Silex people. I would also like to thank Alternatives Funeral and Cremation Services for supporting the gallery and our artist talks. Tonight, I'm very happy to introduce to you Victoria Billigan. Victoria Billigan is an Australian artist who combines artistic practice with teaching at the University of Melbourne. She graduated with a double degree in arts and music performance in Ukraine. After migrating to Australia, she obtained degrees in fine arts and music performance. She has participated in over 150 national and international group and solo exhibitions art events and residences across China, Latin America, Australia, Europe, and India. She is engaged in printmaking, drawing, painting, and book illustration. And her work has some themes of the human condition, um, isolation, displacement, um, which she will talk more about in her talk. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping, housekeeping before we begin this talk will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel and website. So if you feel comfortable, please turn on your mic and camera at the end of the talk during our Q&A period to ask Victoria a question. I will also be taking questions in the chat if you would prefer that route. Without further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Victoria Billogan. Hi Megan, hello everyone. I'm surprised I've got so many people on Easter holiday and um, that was the thing. I actually, when I signed up for this, I was ready to do it on the 1st of April, which is an iconic date for the city where I grew up. It's usually a parade of humor because it's, um, in West it's called the Fool's Day, right? April the 1st. But um, back in Ukraine, we used to celebrate it with jokes and um, funny installations. So it was a big parade that we had on the 1st of April. So I was very, very happy to do it, but then we found out it's actually happening on the 2nd of April. So thanks for your time, taking it off your time off. Uh, I just want to show my little Eastern chick, no, Easter chick, sorry, Easter chick, who is ready. He's got his little computer. So this piece is from my last exhibition, um, which I made for the book prize. And uh, I will begin short presentation here. So let me have a look if it's coming back. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. I've never done this shared thing before. So bear with me. And that's not it. And that's not it. So how do we do that? Megan, do you know how I can share this? Yeah, you're already sharing. So if you just go back to the top there and start at your first slide, you should be good to go. Uh huh. Well, what I don't see is my presentation. That's a problem. Oh, okay. I can see your presentation. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming everyone else can. <laughs> do you want to show me where it is? <laughs> okay. I think I'm getting on top. No, I'm not getting on top of it. So. Yes, yeah, always these things. This is always new. We love technology here. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I do not. I know it delivers so much, but OK, where is my keynote presentation? Um, mm, I need help, to be honest. Okay. So uh, let, let me, me stop here. here and I'll try to do it once again. Maybe I okay. will be sure to do it that way. Uh -huh. okay, here we go. Okay, I've got my presentation now, and then I'm going to share it. Uh, okay. So as you can see, I've done some zooming, but not enough to be virtuoso in this. That's unfortunate. Uh, That's okay. We are happy to be here. Good. Gallery view. Start share. There you go. Okay. Keynote. There we go. Okay. So, I would like to start with a simple introduction, just to remind me what I would like to talk about. Uh, you posed a question to talk about 
what inspires me and what my practice is. And uh, I thought about it a little bit because some artists say, yes, we have a message and others completely deny it. They say there is no message in what we do. We just enjoy doing it. And I find both opinions are correct, but I also find that what you say talks about you and what you don't say talks about you. So in any case, it's a form of thinking. It's a form of expression for all artists in different ways. And um, for me, I looked back and I thought what it is for me, because for me, it's act of curiosity. It's um, noticing something that other may not notice and trying to capture that and hopefully it'll live forever. So for me, it is a curiosity. It is about thinking. It's about seeing. And I found the medium that I loved the most uh, because I loved drawing. I basically turned up to the Victorian College of the Arts and I asked the committee what would they tell me which course I can pick up because I, as much as I love concepts uh, and ideas, um, I love just simple act of drawing and physicality of it. And they suggested doing printmaking because at that at that point, Melbourne University embraced, um, you know, Randalou's concepts and everybody was going conceptual. Nobody liked pictorial images. So I went into some sort of antique art which uses these strange devices, you know, it's all physical, it's all dirty, it's all toxic, it's all you completely immersed into this medium and um, it changes you. So anyhow, I thought about it and I called my presentation Acts of Resilience. And I'm not a revolutioner. I'm just saying that isolation shared ceases to exist. For me, it's very important because I'm interested in uh, displacement and um, psychology. And as a pianist, of course, I I've learned a lot about the process, how you perform and what happens to you and how you transfer that to the audience. So when I entered the scene of art, which I was doing all my life, it was not possible to do in Ukraine as a double degree fully. Um, I had to kind of focus on one, but I was continuing the other one, just couldn't get official training and his official degree. So I did the double degree, whichever was possible. And then when I came to Australia, I did my master's in piano and I picked up bachelor in uh, major um, printmaking. So for me, it was means to find connection with others. And I think this is an ultimate as an existen existentialist. It's a multiple, mul it's, a, it's an important goal for us to feel connected. And people don't understand it, but we actually do everything to either escape or connect. And uh, sometimes we're trying to escape ourselves. Sometimes we're trying to do things to get busy and not to face ourselves. And we find different ways of dealing with this. So I find art is the best um, bridge for communication. If not with anyone else, then with, you, with, you, with yourself. Um, Irving Yalom is an um, existential um, philosopher and psychotherapist and an author who writes about quite interesting things. He writes about things we don't like be to be talking. Uh, it's about uh, death anxiety, meaning of life, um, who we are as people here, all big questions. But he talks about it in a way that is useful for us so it's not abstract uh, he talks about understanding that life is finite and um, once we understand it like great Greeks understood it once and they say smell the roses right we start living to the full we do not put anything for later we actually participate in life we we learn how to engage with life in a different way and um, for me, that sense of curiosity brought me to uh, particularly printmaking because I was always doing art. So I put this um, little etching here, Embraces One. It was etching photography based on my drawing, which I made when I started doing tango in Argentina after a quite difficult period uh, in my life. Um, and I found that 
all arts are connected and we are connected and um, however isolated we feel once we reach to someone else or to ourselves, we don't feel that isolated and um, I thought this would be a focus of my talk today because there is too many themes that I could talk about but since we're all in pandemic and we're post pandemic in Melbourne we can talk about connection and isolation and displacement and as one of my colleagues put darkness in my work which I disagree with so these three works um, I presented for jury to be part of the trial, and luckily they chose it so I will just say a few things about them and uh, of course I will welcome many questions after if they arise. Uh, I've made these works not to state anything and they were made before the pandemic started uh, and for me they still reflected the same state so during the pandemic when we were in the hard lockdown in Melbourne I've discovered that Probably most of my life, I've been connected to isolation, quarantine, and everything that everybody on the globe was going through. Um, all of a sudden, everybody started to feel it. The way we felt it in Ukraine was the year when I was born. It was an interesting connection to make again. So when I was born in 1970, uh, it was a year of cholera. And if everybody knows, cholera is a disease called highly contagious and um, there is certain, it's very heavy, certain percentage of people can die from it. So in 17th, there was big quarantine, and I know that when I was born, my father couldn't even cross uh, the, the border to see me, so he had to stay in quarantine for three months. And that story came only during the isolation when we talked with my mom. So I realized that the whole Ukraine after that like my grandmother everybody was so cautious and washing their hands and you know trying to be to control this epidemic and pandemics that it was probably distilled into my blood somehow all the habits and um, we have a culture of that yes so we kind of understand that when there is a virus or a danger you come all together and you abide the rules and you're trying to contain it so anyhow, all these thoughts came to my mind. These works were made before that. And um, I guess I made them in a, in a time of my life when I was working. There were two reasons I was working with uh, mesotint and with aquatint. So when you do aquatint, you use a finest rosin power, powder. And uh, <clears throat> it's so fine that when you breathe it, you basically, you know, it stays in your lungs. So it can cause a lot of damage. And um, I was making it not wearing a mask, well, only in the box. And I started coughing a lot. So my teacher said, well, you should, should wear a mask. So I got a gas mask and uh, started wearing it, working with a really big plate, um, 70 by 50. Copper is quite heavy. So I prepared the plate and I, at that time, I had uh, an image of myself going through that. and. Um, somehow there was something in it that I thought well I'd like to explore it and uh, normally I prepare a plate so I'll just have a little mini plate here yes I prepare a plate and I rock it as mezzotint people do yes they rock it and then you ink it you, get, you draw your image in and then you ink it and then you print it so with a big plate it was a little bit different uh, you have to to do it slightly differently so what happens you scrape from the darkness you scrape your image out from the dark and when Megan asked me well how do you reach that black deep black background that's exactly how you do it um, you rock the plate so I'll just talk about and show how it works here so here is the plate and you rock it with a rocker I've got a device which is really heavy and um, 
I might show. So that's, well, of course, printmakers know about the process, but people who don't, you put about 29 passes in all directions. Uh, it's a very long <laughs> and tedious job. And uh, then it becomes all uh, kind of like a sandpaper and uh, you can start scraping in it when it's ready and it's dense. So you end up with image that comes up from the dark. Yes. And then you print it. They can't start from scratch. Develop. Yes. And then it results hopefully mm -hmm. in the image that you want. So sometimes it's not resulting in that image and you have to deal with a lot of fixing and scraping for the scraping. So that's the final image of that plate that I did in 2020. So after I did these two images, I actually was obsessed with the masks because they have so many connotations and meanings. And um, it's for me, it was a sign of protection, sign of oppression, sign of coming out of something and uh, coming out of darkness. So when, when people asked me, well, why your work is so dark? I basically was surprised. I said, well, my work is not about darkness, it's about light. So to me, light was really important, still is. And uh, I, I found it's a theme in everything I do, all the mediums that I try, whether it's photography, printmaking, uh, painting, or other mediums that I uh, endeavor to try. So this plate was made in 2019, just when the fire started and the COVID was about to begin. I had friends from um, just visitors from China who came in just before the borders locked down. And this plate was um, a slightly damaged plate in a way. I love the, the way that printmaking allows us to work with mistakes. So I utilize the, the see if I can make it bigger. Maybe I can't, but maybe I can. So I utilized the marks that were already on the plate and uh, I used them as you know reference to what happens now with um, COVID-19. And I never look for work to be socially, uh, how to say, responding to some social events but the process, the thinking process, my reactions usually result into the image that could be related to what's happening or could be related to what happens to me or what, what I'm thinking about intensely. So because all the work happens in, in my head, mostly, I have very little sketches. So I work mainly directly on the plates. I prepare it and then I just draw with charcoal the drawing that I need to draw. And that charcoal, because charcoal is so movable, it allows me to move it the way I want. And then I start immediately working with a scraper, scraping into the plates. So that's how these plates were made. Uh, they might look controlled, but um, they are done this way. And this one I printed in red uh, when the Australian fire started. And then after that, I saw actually a photo of a girl who was um, escaping the fires, hiding on the water with her family uh, when fire engulfed uh, the area and the only, you know, they could only save themselves being in the water. And that red light, can, I can't forgive that red light. So in a way, some works appeared a little bit before the events that they might be referred to. Um, now I'm showing this because I might think, you know, I think my, some printmakers could actually like me showing that. So since I'm a pianist as well, and um, rocking by hand is a very um, damaging activity for the piano player. Uh, my friend designed this from, um, I think it's dumbbell called, yes. So he made this device. It rests on one side and I'm able, I'll just bring the camera a bit closer, so I'm able to rock it, which also is not good for your wrist, but at least it's a bit of weight and control there, so it makes it more tolerable. And by the way, anyone who wants to learn about how to make it can reach me out.
for simple questions. So, uh, as we are moving on, I, I thought I'll bring it in a slightly whimsical way. This quote that stayed with me for a long time since I heard it. So, um, I've listened to some lectures about uh, Jung, you know, the uh, psychologist and uh, one of the great founders of psychoanalysis. And why I love him over Freud is because he doesn't deny the mystical part of uh, psychology and collective consciousness and the way that we connect it. Um, and I found there was a lecture and this person, Jordan Peterson, was mentioning that life is suffering and meaning makes it worthwhile. I'm not sure it was his uh, quote, but um, that's something I remembered from his talk. And I thought, well, that makes, that makes sense because if anyone is ready and open to talk about life without trying to be avoiding what life is. Life is everything. It's suffering, it's happiness, it's pain and it's pleasure. And I found that emotions are universal. And um, we understand pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering without speaking even the same language. We, we understand it through music. Music communicates it. Art communicates it and it's universal. So that's something that unites us and not divides us. What I found though in Australia uh, in the last maybe 10 years, there was a so-called positivistic bubble when probably one generation grew up trying to avoid talk about unpleasant things or unpleasant feelings and um, it caused some sort of damage because people grow in a bubble and uh, they cannot accept that life can throw at you anything. And the most important thing is to learn and to teach yourself and others how to be resilient uh, in the face of adversity. Um, it's not the main focus of my practice and not the main focus of my life, but being displaced and moving from Ukraine to Australia made me feel that I have kind of another view of the world because of where I come from and my experience. So this piece I made, it's all the same technique, the same um, mezzotint, tacotin based plates. So this mezzotint was made um, before the lockdown, just about, about to start. And um, it's called the lockdown. I made, well, what I found that during the lockdown I started writing title, putting something on Instagram, which I only started using four years ago at uh, my, one of my art residences. And it kind of was interesting practice. At first I hated it, but then I've learned that it's immediate and it's really mobile. So I started putting my images there as website is quite clunky and can't be updated that quickly. And when I was writing my titles, I was continuing and I, they ended up in some sort of longer text and some of them were perceived as poems. So this one I'll read because um, when the lockdown only started uh, and it was a great time of uncertainty, I think it resonated with many people. The lockdown, pandemic of fear, prisoners of our own mind, fear, I said by the great, is the cheapest room in the house. Remember, breakdown is a breakthrough. Um, of course, it was Winston, Winston Ch Churchill who said that fear is the cheapest room in the house. And uh, being locked in my little studio, bed sitter in Melbourne, not having access to the art studio or anything, uh, made me think a lot. And um, it resulted in a big project which was called Lockdown Diary, which was uh, just exhibited recently at Fire Station Pre Making Studio as as an award for, for the work that I will talk about later, which uh, won a grand prize. So masks and mezzotint. Uh, the plates are large and what I love about pre-making, well, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, is you never know what comes out at the other end of the press. 
And that element of surprise is probably what attracts me to to the this particular mezzotint practice because you end up with a terribly black plate and you need to work it through and work it more and until you get what you really envisioned. So this was big plates done in Guanlan base at um, in China at printmaking base, and uh, finally that was the result that I managed to get. So as I said, sharing my practice means sharing the way I think and see things. I, I leave it a lot to the chance and spontaneity and a lot of experiments. So these two big plates were also made in China during my grant residency in 2017 in Tianjin. And um, I used mistakes and I had a, basically a motto, work with what you have. Uh, with you know you can't have ideal instruments you can't have ideal conditions you can't always have that positivistic absolutely perfect world where everything will work the way you want so for me what that was challenge to work with what I had at my hands and learning on the way so the work on the left was actually about Tianjin which is a new CC and um, it's been just you know built the superficial sea and the enormous scale of the built, how they built up, was so impressive. It was a ghost city. There was no one except us, printmakers, two or three people in that base at that stage. And uh, I saw people of, you know, coming from rural villages to this absolute novelty. They don't know what the sea is like. And they look at it. And uh, for me, it was fascinating to see how they react like children you know old and you know and kids and everyone and the skies were amazing so I used quite non-traditional ways <laughs> of making the skies I scraped directly into plate and used all instruments that were at my disposal and these bits are mezzotinted by hand so it took many many hours <laughs> and a lot of pain but I'm satisfied with it um, so these two plates were also made uh, during my residency and uh, they reflect what I saw, but also some metaphoric um, kind of imagery in the sky. So this work on the left is called The Unbearable Lightness of Being and I refer to the famous writer Milos Kundera. Um, he wrote this beautiful novel, uh, Czech, Czech writer. He wrote it about um, basically time before and after Velvet Revolution when um, Czech were freed from um, communist oppression and um, it's about two people it's about uh, we can call it love story but what's important is that life is seen in its beauty and its ugliness at the same time and once you accept it you can fully participate in it without waiting for being happy 100% until you die. And um, there was a quote by George Orwell, which I had, but apparently it went away. So he said that, I'll just try to interpret it, it's impossible to live thinking that you'll be always happy. So the real happiness starts when you don't expect and don't assume you will be happy forever. Uh, I fully agree with it. and. Um, these are works that I made in China and they've been exhibited there in Tianjin pre-making base. So it's the same process and now about the process. So this is another part of my practice. Uh, they're big woodcuts. This is about meter by meter and ten. And um, I would say that I made them a little bit out of desperation because we were locked down again and um, we were locked down back in Tianjin. Uh, what happened, we were not allowed to go out and we couldn't understand with another artist, with Roman sister, what happens, why they follow us and they don't let us out. They were afraid that, you know, we get lost or something will happen to us, but uh, they would never tell us up front. And I thought, God, I want to be that something that can escape through the window, which we actually did later. And um, I brought my old little etching, little drawing that I had about this shoal of fish 
and uh, just started carving the fish. It took me two days to carve this block by hand and um, I don't know how many but there were lots of fishes and uh, then I had another follow-up woodcut um, made and was called Don't Stop. It was made in during my short visit to China in 2018 actually. Um, why do I talk about woodcuts? Because that physicality, so you know this talk made me think again that physicality of a process is very attractive to me as being a pian trained as a pianist from the childhood you have your hands and that's all you have to to express something and you know the touch how you touch the keys the sound you produce you become aware of the whole process and the mark making so with woodcut for me it's really direct it, it just what you make how you feel in that moment and the memory is connected to it like every mark carries the memory so it's very tactile and physical and uh, I do miss it because um, I think contemporary, time, contemporary times empowers us with technology but it takes away that full immersion, that full physicality of our practice and being human and uh, what I do, I experiment, uh, curiosity leads the way, the physicality and emotions and see me seeing something others don't see. This little piece is from my uh, wood carving, the little shavings, and um, I've turned them into just a little piece of underwear, I guess. Well, it was a sculpture. It was a little kind of joke, um, if you were, if you want. Um, I'm going a little bit forward. Um, so during the lockdown, uh, as I was deprived of having access to studio, I had to set up my own here in a small flat. And um, I entered the competition a while before that started. It was artist book competition here. Uh, I've never made artist books as such. Of course, I had some sessions on it during my study and my training. And I loved books since I was a kid. I uh, had probably all collections of fairy tales and books with illustration and uh, spend hours and days with them, especially when you're sick. So I entered the competition. I had no work to present because we were in a hard lockdown, no art supplies, no way of printing it the way you want it. So I, I thought maybe I'll pick up the idea that I had developed previously, which was um, a scroll. Uh, which kind of goes back to 2006 when I was a uh, graduate at uh, VCA, College of the Arts, as a printmaker. In the last year we studied a lot of collaborative uh, practices and did it uh, with filmmakers, with dancers, sound engineers, everything you want. And we followed that new trend by Gilles Deleuze uh, that any information comes from somewhere, it's like based on laws of physics that energy exists and it can only change, you know, tra transform into something else. So nothing exists without nothing. And we can transform sound into image, image into movement, visual into uh, audio. Uh, I was fascinated by that. It was last year and um, I wrote uh, a, work, a work that um, was to do with my ability to read notation. So as a musician, of course, you are... Yes, you play music and you look at the score, and score is literally marks on the paper, the same as printmaking. And those marks evolved over time. They evolved from numic um, symbols, which are here at the very, very start. So this is a fragment of Gothic Rotonda, Gothic Rotonda, a Renaissance um, text with notation and text. And then it kind of moves a little bit forwards, and then it's been transformed mm -hmm. up to now uh, days when we can see um, I'll show you now. We can see notation in a very different way, like waves on your phone and other presentations. So that was quite exciting. I composed a piece. Um, I took a text and made my own algorithm, if you call it, and um, I gave it to different performance, and they all 
interpreted that text, they sung it, they played it on a violin because it became a piano score. So I turned it into a piano score. And um, that was it. And then I met, uh, I found a person who actually was doing it on a more professional level, it was Roger Olsip, uh, who I hope is here. Um, he was a sound multimedia artist and sound engineer and it happened that we were interested in the same thing. So we haven't met for many, many years and we only reconnected recently. But um, during this, back to my book, artist book, I thought, well, I'll go back to my piano roll. Uh, I use pianola roll and I started putting marks on it and text and my woodcut, this woodcut by hand. And it resulted in um, lots of poems because during the lockdown I was walking with my mother. Uh, I was only allowed walk uh, along the shore for, I don't know, one or two kilometers. And it was the same route every day for 100 plus days. And we, during these walks, we collected a lot of stuff. We saw a lot of things. We we basically rediscovered each other and ended up, I ended up with a lot of poems um, which were connected to images that I found. But this is a different talk, so I will not bring about that. But what I want to show is those marks. See the marks for the Roger made them. Marks how the piano keys look like and the notes. And for me, it was an intriguing connection. So visualization of sound is incredibly interesting. Uh, what I'd like to do is to play some of it. We'll see if I'm able to do that. And if not, I might do it later. So I decided to work on this project for book award using what I had. And I had only um, a thread, book thread, inks and my piano roll and um, I kind of referred to our walks through this landscape and also referred to the text that was already inbuilt into the piano roll because each piano roll has text uh, lyrics so sound and the song that has a particular meaning so that was a multi-layered work uh, and light was shining through these little holes, which are note, duration, and pitch. And um, I wrote my poetry along the way. And the work, the work won a grand prize. So this unfinished title slide is actually a cover for the CD that we've made. And uh, Roger also turned my poems into the music, into the soundtracks with his magic and we compiled it into the CD. So, okay. There were a lot of sound here and uh, I'll just see if I can deliver it. So that Venice soundscape, I'm trying to kind of draw a line and talk about the, the project that I, I'm interested in now, as much as I'm still doing my aquatins and um, mezzotins, this is the one that I'm focusing at the moment. So this is the score of the sound of the Venice soundscape that I collected during my residences in the last four years. I made recordings everywhere I was, and uh, the idea was to represent the sound of the place, so it's a site-specific soundscape. Uh, I wonder why it's not... Okay, it's playing. Thank you. 
So uh, this is a piano transcription of the sound of Venice, which is uh, here when I was, let me see if I've got this right, the actual bells, I want to find the bells, yes, here we are. This recording was made in the same day during Easter, probably a few days from now, in April 2018, as I was doing my artist residence. So this is the original recording that you just listened to. to listen to the bells this is really fantastic actually it just reacts to my touch So um, this piece was actually presented in a calligraphy exhibition at Scuola Grafica Venezia in 2017. Um, everything was made on spot with all the materials I had. And um, it was a funny story, actually. We had to present it during this Easter time, and you're not supposed there is no bells during Easter. No church rings the bell. and. Um, I wasn't aware of that, and uh, I had to put I put a, a soundscape soundtrack next to my work, and uh, we had it sound in a gallery during the opening. Uh, so um, then we were shushed and basically told that no, no, you're not supposed. It was the only place that had bells um, during that Easter time in Venice. So these are multidisciplinary works, and um, the prints were, were and will be connected to the piano roll. So the book 
uh, the book is here and uh, I, I used a piano scroll again idea the most basic and ancient first book which was bearing all the marks it was more like a visual diary of the lockdown period and I played with the text that was on the roll and um, put my own text and little hiding places and hand printed woodcuts and uh, it kind of culminated in the fish and uh, finally uh, finally it wind off at the very top so it's about two meter and, uh, and ten minutes uh, sorry two, two meter and ten centimeter long and uh, it was awarded for working with text and uh, experiment with form and craftsmanship so I was very honored to get that prize and as a result of that prize so that's the top I was having a small show in cabinet which was making sense for the lockdown it was a cabinet show that just finished and what I did I delved into making some artist books and um, with everything that I worked with during the lockdown was pictorial photography and um, some 3d works some just little joke works funny works and some pinhole photography and my scrolls are at the back as well as objects that are called Mobius strip because um, see that little scroll there that's actually score from music box and um, that's how we see the sound which if you pull the music box I'm sure everybody used it you hear the sound so that connection to me is still quite fascinating and I'm going to work on this more hopefully with Roger. So the experiments are in many areas and uh, I do them lightly. These are digital. I made this piece called In Soap We Trust. When we're using soap during the lockdown every whatever 20 minutes and um, the little sculpture that's I made and um, I continued motif of mask as oxygen mask and some pinhole photos so these are just a little experiments and most interesting is the pinhole camera which is so similar to the practice that I do as a mezzotint you basically draw with light so you put a silver plate or uh, you know um, a, uh, what do you call it a roll film roll and it's a box with a hole and the amount of light that enters the box draws on the back of that uh, silver plate. So you basically see only what's been exposed to the light and the incredible effects. So I was exploring and still exploring that and I uh, will use it in my new practice mesotint. I guess this is about all about my practice uh just to touch on that really uh, i can show some physical objects and i wanted to conclude with this video mm -hmm. i will never forget my dear friend in guanlan who looked at my work girl in a mask and said my goodness your work is so dark so oppressive you must be such a like really sad person and i laughed and yes i said no i'm not but um we all are and i want you to see this video so the big inspiration for me is actual life people, um, things that I see that are a bit unusual, things that I want to say that are important. And um, during this last residency before the global lockdown, I was doing a course in Baroque uh, in Europe. And one of them was Stuttgart, um, sorry, Strasbourg, uh, and also Czechoslovakia. But um, we were lucky to play an organ that's been in a Strasbourg dome and um, put a concert after that, of course. So this was a little respite from our practice and I want you to see that if that works. <laughs>
yes. So that was the piece to show how everything is connected. practicing their yeah, trills um, and the organ that I had to play just to illustrate how important is the tactile nature of the pre-making personally for me because I, I like working with hands and um, for me that's the best practice to be honest Thank you. Um, I would love to have questions or whatever you like to talk about. And I'll just take this opportunity to show that I made some books. I've never done them before the way I made them here. They're very traditional, yes. And they're all about embrace and what we've lost during the pandemic, our ability to embrace each other. So they're based on my drawings that I've made during my tango in tango endeavors in Argentina. Um, yes, ask me questions. Thank you so much for that, Victoria. That was amazing. Um, I'm just going to turn on gallery view. So if anyone wants to pop on with their video and their sound and ask a question or say a comment, um, while I'm waiting for that, you did have a comment in the chat from Briar, who is one of the creators of the OBT. Um, so he just said, hi Victoria, I'm Briar Craig, a printmaker. I'm one of the jurors for the Okanagan Print Triennial. We are thrilled to have your work in the exhibition. It is lovely and rigorous and my students have been impressed. And then he just said he had to go. So he wanted to say thank you and everything before he left. Thank you so much, Say, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm honored to be in the company of great artists. Really fr thrilled. Everything is just, yeah, fantastic um well do you have yeah. a question no let's see here anyone oh. is happy to pop on whenever i know it was quite long i didn't expect it to be so long no that was great but yes people are here and maybe they just don't know how to how to I'll give it a sec here I do have a question if no one else does. Um, have you had many comments then about the mask images and COVID, even though I love how you brought that back to when you were born and what was going on in Ukraine at the time um, and how that image can be kind of multi-purpose throughout however many years it can keep coming into into what's happening in life. Do you have many comments about that sort of thing? You know, it was a bit, it was a weird feeling because um, when the COVID happened, right, I already had the work and I was almost ashamed of showing it because it was, was feeling like, okay, she's just catching the moment, trying to be cool and hip. Everybody's doing masks now. So she's going to just ride the wave. And I wasn't showing it. I was really ashamed of showing it because I said, oh goodness, I made it. And now it's like everybody else's problem. Now I had a lot of questions because um, in Kiev, what, what happened during the lockdown? With the lockdown, I, I had to cancel my trip, which meant to have these works, the girl with a mask that's behind me and that's in the Triennale. And it was called Lifeline. And it meant to happen in, um, March 2020. So I meant to play some concerts and had four exhibitions, one big solar residence in China and one in Kiev with exactly these works, only masks called Lifeline with, you know, this pulsating heart, like, you know, when, when you die, you have this light, light path. So 
that was the idea. And when we, on the 21st, I had a call, you can't go, the borders are closed, all my friends call, we have to stop. I, I sat down, I thought, that can't be happening. So they said, well, it's all your masks, you know, it's all your mask, you brought it on to us. And they had a big banner, like four meter by four meter with girl in a mask, and they didn't know what to do. They said, look, if we put it on, people are so angry and so, you know, in so much pain that they may think that we're kind of mocking that kind of state of everybody is in trouble and you trying to somehow uh, capitalize the situation. So I had different comments. So the artist who organized it, she said to me, look, you're like a prophet, really. You made this kind of comment on isolation and now we're all in it. And I said, well, we all were there, but nobody wanted to pay attention. I was just the one who brought up this uncomfortable topic. And um, somehow some people react to it in a proper way, you know, so because it's not actually the mask that we wear in and I, I was not trying to make one with the mask that, you know, we use for viral COVID, but I will. <laughs> now I will, I think. Awesome. So we did have a couple comments. We had some more comments saying, thank you for your talk, Victoria. Very informative. Love hearing about your process. Excellent fusion of printmaking and the music, Victoria. I like your book project. Yeah, Bridget. Okay, I'll give it another minute here if anyone has anything else they want to ask. Uh, they can always write to me. I've got a website which is uh, has immigrated from migrated from an old website, so it's in the process of fixing. But uh, yeah, you can always contact me. Of course, live conversation is the best. And uh, I really, I just want to ask if there is anyone who works uh, with the same process with um, mezzotint and aquatint and how they see their work as dark or not dark. That's kind of my question to the audience. Okay, I love it. Does the color, does the color define the content? Does it mean they are dark and um, unhappy? Roger is here. Yes, Roger, who was making the work. New message. Was the puppet express, expressing the music? Yes, Pamela. The puppet was following, it was improvisation. The puppet was following the little trills and practice of someone who practiced the organ. So yes, I was trying to do that. Um, just an illustration that good and bad and great and funny, they coexist. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it was just a little respite, really, inter intermedia. All right. Okay. Well, aw, lots of good comments from everyone. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I, and especially after realizing what day it actually was in Australia, my bad. So <laughs> thank oh, you yes. so much. Hello from the future. And um, thank you so much for making this work. And yeah, we really appreciate it. And I loved hearing about your process. Uh, uh, somebody said, congratulations, enjoying watching with your mother. Oh, she would be pleased. Yes. Oh, very nice. Right. Thank you so much, Megan. Thanks, everyone. For Thank you, Victoria. And thanks for everyone for coming and have a great rest of your day and Easter weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.